Hi, I'm Dr. Ken Beattie. I'm a TESOL professor, and I work with graduate students and doctoral students online. I'd like to share some ideas today about teaching online and learning online. Online teaching and learning are increasing globally. So how do we make it work? Remote teaching isn't new. As far back as 1728, it was being used to teach courses such as shorthand over great distances. The invention of postage stamps in 1840 saw an explosion in correspondence courses. Just 18 years later, universities began offering correspondence courses for degrees. 80 years after that, radio was introduced as a way of teaching students remotely. 15 years after that came the first televised credit courses. Finally, in 1989, the first online bachelor's and master's degree courses were offered online. And then came the telephone. The mobile telephone changed everything because we were essentially putting a computer in students' pockets. Not only did they have a computer that they could use to search for information online, they could make their own information recording videos, recording audios, taking photographs, and being able to share them with other students and, of course, with their teachers. In this talk today, I'd like to answer eight questions, starting with, how do I get involved with remote teaching? The first step is to think about yourself in terms of your computer awareness or your computer literacy. What do you already know? I'm sure you already know quite a bit. For example, you know how to use email, how to attend webinars. Probably you use some kind of social media, and you may use video tools and camera tools on your phone and search tools. There's a lot more. Make a list for yourself and really consider what do you know? What are your strengths? It's a small step to use the basic skills and tools that you already have to help your students learn online. As you do this, take time to build a community of learning with your students, with other teachers, with parents. You're not alone. Try to think of other people who can help you in the teaching and the learning process. One first step is to identify expertise. Ask your students, what are they good at? What technology are they familiar with that they can help you and other students with? Even email alone can help, but you need to make sure that each of your students has email. Now, this doesn't have to be your problem. Reach out to other students. Other students can help their friends. They can contact them easily and they can talk them through the steps for setting up an email account. If you are working with very young students, then their parents can help. One other really important area is social media. Uh, students will use this for practicing their conversations. Again, find out the students who are experts with social media so that they can connect other students into groups. The big thing to remember is that teachers are natural problem solvers. It's what we do every day when we walk into the classroom and are confronted with something new and unusual and have to think of a solution for it. We can get through this. You can teach online. It's not too much of a challenge for you. The second question is, how can I organize myself to deliver distance learning to my students? A really important first step is to maintain your motivation. Now, it can be difficult working at home alone, and in a recent study, 17% of workers who were working at home found that they were lonely, found <laughs> that they felt cut off from their community. So again, it's really important for you to reach out with other teachers and form a community so that you can talk, solve problems, share successes, much as the same way you would over lunch in the staff room or during coffee breaks. It's equally important to encourage students to connect as well. Get them partners. Get them into small groups. Get them in a situation where they can ask other students if they need help. 
If you're working from home, find a dedicated workspace, something that's free from distractions. Also, make sure that during your class contact hours that nothing's going on behind you or in your home, such as the washing machine, that is somehow going to interfere with connecting with the students. The number one distraction for most people is their own telephone. Make sure the sound is turned off and it's out of sight so it's not interrupting you, again, while you're trying to connect with students. I know that the presentation of yourself and your classroom are important. Try to do the same when you're teaching online. For example, be conscious of where the light is coming from. If there's a strong light behind you, such as a window, students won't be able to see your face. If your laptop is on a table at keyboard level, then probably you're looking down into it and it can be a little scary for students if it appears like this. Instead, try to make sure that your eyes are at the same level as your camera. Ah, this is perfect. Taking a little time to set up your home office so that it's well lit and well organized will make you feel more comfortable and make your students feel more comfortable as well. The third question is, how do online lessons differ from face-to-face -face lessons? Well, the biggest challenge is that getting students to work together is a little more difficult. In the classroom, you can just say, get into pairs, get into a small group, let's teach the whole class. But online, that's always much more challenging. One big issue is whether or not the class is synchronous or asynchronous. What's the difference? Well, in a synchronous class, everything's taking place at the same time for the teacher and for the students. In an asynchronous cl class, what happens is often the teacher will deliver some lecture and the students go off to do their own work. The teacher may record the lecture or record a little bit of a talk and the students go off to do their own work. Essentially, things are not always happening at the same time in an asynchronous class. The other big issue is that students require a great deal of discipline. In the classroom, there's a limited number of distractions, but at home there are so many. Would I rather just go have something to eat, or maybe I want to play a game, or I think I'll listen to music for a little while, or I'll just even just sleep. There are so many different things that students can be doing rather than schoolwork. They need a schedule. And also, they need to get rid of their excuses. There are always these things like, uh, oh, the dog ate my homework. Well, in a virtual classroom, teaching online, we need students to be on task and to manage their own behaviors. This really starts with time management, with the expectation that students are going to organize themselves, and we have to help them to do this, of course starting off with just some kind of a daily schedule for what they are expected to do for each hour of study that they should be completing. You need to set up expectations and schedule time for students when they're going to be taking their online classes, when they should be working on their own, when they should be connecting with other students to do other assignments, such as conversation. Unlike a regular school in which you might have office hours, students are sometimes uncertain of when they should contact you. Of course, they can always leave an email message and encourage them to do so. By the same token, also check in on your students, regularly reaching out to them just to make sure everything is okay and that their studies are progressing. Something else important for students is an idea of your turnaround times how long it will take you to get back to them if they send you an email message or if they send you an assignment. You can indicate this by a return email, but also you can just tell students, I will get back to you within 12 hours or within 24 hours. If you don't hear from me after that time, please email me again with your question or with your assignment. In an online class, it's extremely important to give meaningful feedback. In this feedback, you should always try to say something very positive to help encourage students. Of course, you can also go through and correct all the errors and problems that students have, 
but giving them a hopeful tone is important. In my own classes, I always pick one good thing that each student has done, and then I share it with all the rest of the students. This helps to create a sense of community among the learners, and it shows even the least able student that they can do something right. In their online classes, students should be practicing good online etiquette, that is, treating each other and the teacher with respect. It's important for students to understand these rules, and one way to create them is to ask the students themselves to draw up a list of what is and is not acceptable online. This makes them do a little bit of extra work in English. This also fits in with a general idea that runs throughout this webinar and throughout the idea of online teaching, and that is to shift responsibility to the students, make them partners, make them more involved in the everyday decisions about their online educations. The fourth question has to do with what are the most efficient and effective ways to flip learning? Flip learning? I thought we were talking about online learning. Actually, the two ideas have a lot in common. There's some controversy about when flipped learning started exactly, but in 2007, a couple of high school teachers had the idea that maybe the students should be learning more at home and then just coming to school with their questions and actually using what they've learned at home. They called it a flipped classroom. Now, in the traditional face-to-face -face language classroom, students come to class to use the language. And they also come with concepts that they've had difficulty with, any questions that they have. Now, the same is true online. So a starting point for you is to consider what can students do on their own at home? What can they do on, at home with other students, maybe connecting through social media? And what do they need you to do? In general, students can work on preparing their vocabulary and grammar and doing reading and writing at home. However, this does not mean that you simply say, yes, do your grammar, do your vocabulary, do your reading and writing. You have to set it up. You have to set up with your expectations. What are they supposed to be doing? What should they be reading? How should they be reading it? What should they be looking for? What skills should they be applying? So you have to start off by giving them a briefing on what is expected of them and then follow up once they've done the work to see again what questions and problems they've had but also for them to demonstrate what they've learned. However, students need to practice their conversations, practice their talks with one another and they can use social media to do this. They can practice using platforms such as Skype, Google Hangouts, Microsoft Teams, so that they can see the person that they're talking to. This is not just about using facial expressions to get their message across, but it's also, again, building that sense of community, that learning community, that they feel a little less lonely and a little more connected to other people. As students practice their conversations, encourage them to record them as well. They can listen to these recordings to see what they can improve. And then, at the end, once they're totally confident, they can make another recording to send to you. That's the one that you can mark and give them feedback on. The fifth question is, how can I engage students in an online class to ensure active participation? Building on those expectations that we mentioned earlier are goals and paths to get them there. Use your textbook or course syllabus to explain the tasks that students have to complete and the deadlines by which they need to complete them. To give students a sense of achievement, set short, medium, and long-term goals. Short-term goals can be things like learning new vocabulary every day, Medium-term goals should be something like completing a video project over the course of a week. A longer-term goal could be reading a new book in English. To keep students on track, it's important that they report on their progress frequently, in concrete terms. Uh, you want to find out if there's anything interfering with their ability to complete their work or participate with other students. 
If there are problems, you can always ask the class if others might be able to help them. In terms of reporting, ask students maybe to share what they are happy about that they've been doing. They could maybe keep diaries of their accomplishments, a kind of what I've done instead of a to-do list, and share that with you and share that with other students. You can improve students' motivation by personalizing your assignments and personalizing their goals. Make it a more student-centered classroom in which you encourage students to conduct their own research on personal projects rather than having every single student do the same assignment. This also helps avoid plagiarism. How do you get everyone doing something different? Well, start with the same assignment, but then divide it up. For example, you might ask if you were teaching something about culture to ask students to each choose a different culture or a different country around the world. This ensures that everybody is doing something similar but that they're not competing with each other, all doing the same assignment. When they're not competing, they can collaborate. They can share what they've done on their own personal project so they actually engage in peer teaching. It benefits everyone particularly if they're using English to share their ideas. Here are three ideas about what students can do. The first is to describe a favorite place. Now, everybody will have a different idea in mind, so they all do something different. You can take it further and say, talk to the other students first. Make sure each of you is describing a different place. It's their problem. May shift the responsibility to them to do so. If they're describing a favorite place, they should use all of their senses. Uh, but as a teacher, probably your main focus is to ensure that they're using things like ordinals and sequence words, as well as organizers like front to back, top to bottom, side to side. If you ask them to answer the question, what's your favorite memory? Again, everybody's going to have something quite different, but the interesting thing is from your perspective, you're really forcing them to use the past tense. So again, look at what's in your syllabus and invert it. Try to think of a project that would get students using that grammar, using that vocabulary in an assignment that each of them will personalize. A third example is describing some kind of a process. Now, it could be something like cooking, and to do so, Again, the grammar and the vocabulary that they use is going to be related to ordinals and process words and sequences. The sixth question is, how should I schedule classes for different age groups and at different levels, and how often? The quick answer is that your schedule should mirror the hours that you normally have with the students in class as well as any homework expectations that you have of them. But you may divide up this a little bit. For example, it's probably unusual for you to talk for an hour in a class. Rather, you're more likely to talk for a few minutes, maybe five, ten minutes, and you could videotape that and share that with the students and then have them go off and do their work before they watch the next video about the next step of what you expect them to do. A big advantage of dividing your lectures or your talks into smaller segments is they're easier to share, but also it's easier for students to watch them and watch them again and again. So they get a lot more exposure to the ideas. Of course, you also need to schedule time for students to work together. So that means the time that they're going to be spending using social media or some platforms to communicate with one another. Schedule these or ask the students to schedule it themselves, but check to ensure that they're on task. Also make sure that no one is left out. So ask the students, does anybody still need a partner? And connect them if you need to do so. Grading can be a challenge. Don't be overwhelmed. There's a few things that you can do. First of all, get students to peer edit everything they do. That means turning over their assignments, whether that's a video or a paragraph or an essay or even a drawing, to another student to get some feedback. Everybody learns. Everybody benefits in this way. 
ask students to do portfolios and only mark their three best assignments. This works particularly well with students at upper levels where you expect that they are doing a lot of work and maybe you don't have time to mark everything. Another strategy is to only mark the first 10 errors in any essay. Now, for some students, this may all come in their first paragraph. In others, you may get through the entire essay and only find nine errors. In this way, again, you're rationing your time. And because students often make the same errors over and over again, just correcting a few of them will probably give them guidance as to what else they should fix on their own. The seventh of our eight questions is, what are creative ways to use chat and social media to help students engage with each other? Now, it's pretty easy to get students using social media and chat programs, but what you really need to do is make sure that they're doing so in English. One way is if they're on a platform where you can join in at different times and listen into conversations, they know that they are expected to be speaking in English, and they're more likely to do it. Another way to engage students is to give them regular open-ended questions, maybe a question of the day or a question of the week that they're expected to discuss with other students. For example, you might say, what job would you love to have and what job would you not like to have and why? So students have to think of individual jobs and compare them and then discuss them with each other. Get them into a process of putting together their ideas, discussing them, recording them, reflecting on what they hear, and maybe redoing it again, and going through this process until they're finally confident and ready to record a final version that you can listen to. Another interesting task is to ask students to create something like a wiki, where they share information and build it up online around a particular topic. One idea would be to create a wiki around your own hometown, talking about special things in your own hometown, and maybe including photographs that you have from it. Our eighth and final question is about what technical tools make teaching and learning easier? It's a difficult question with many, many answers. But you can start off by asking your students what tools they are already using. What apps do they have on their phones? What apps do they have on their computers? How could each of those be used to help them improve their reading, writing, listening, and speaking skills? Now, popular choices will be programs like Skype, Google Hangouts, WhatsApp, and Microsoft Teams that allow students to contact each other and see themselves face to face. But there's other apps and other software programs that they might use as well. For example, I use collage programs to organize my photos, and I use mind mapping software to organize my ideas. In terms of practical tips, you should consider each program in terms of what benefits it provides, as well as any shortcomings it might have. Benefits will include, like even with email, the opportunity to share PDFs and files, such as videos and audio clips. This can be a very powerful tool for connecting with students. Shortcomings of many programs may include video and audio that can be unstable, and some programs limit the number of students who can be online at the same time. If you don't know already, you should ask yourself, what does your school have? Uh, does it have a learning management system? Did one come with the textbook series that you're using? How about a conferencing software? Does your school have that? If so, it's a great way to organize your classes. You just have to ask. Finally, get your students reading. It's the most important lifelong learning skill for continuing to improve their English. They'll improve their vocabulary, their grammar, and their critical thinking skills all at the same time. It's important to look for resources that are available in your community, perhaps from libraries and elsewhere. These are available digitally online. Teaching online may seem quite challenging for some of you, but open your minds. Don't be afraid to fail. Be afraid not to try. You can do it. Well, that's a lot of information. I hope some of these ideas have been useful to you. 
and you can share this video with other teachers. Remember, you're not alone. Good luck.